Welcome to the second episode of Human Conditions. The subject of our conversation today is Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, published in 1949. Simone de Beauvoir was born in 1908 in the 6th arrondissement of Paris into a bourgeois Catholic family. She studied philosophy at the Sorbonne and was the youngest person to pass the aggregation exam, yet she never described herself as a philosopher, even as she wrote works of philosophy as well as essays, journalism, and novels. Beauvoir was a founder after the war of the left-wing intellectual journal Les Temps Modernes with her former classmate at the Sorbonne, Jean-Paul Sartre, who was also her life partner. She and Sartre forged an unbreakable pact, an arrangement that allowed for each of them to explore what they called contingent or parallel loves. Among Beauvoir's lovers were the American novelist Nelson Algren and Claude Lanzmann, who would later become famous for his film Shoah. She was also involved with several women, although she never described herself as gay or bisexual. Beauvoir in her lifetime was often overshadowed by her male partner, something she never objected to. Her devotion to Sartre and apparent willingness to play second fiddle to him has become a subject of contention among contemporary feminists. And yet there is no work of Sartre's today that seems quite as vital or fresh or contemporary as The Second Sex, which is not only a Bible of the women's movement, but a key text for thinking about gender in particular and the question of difference more generally. It is dense, rich, provocative, and full of passages whose meanings one can puzzle over infinitely. Above all, perhaps, her signature line, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. Beauvoir never speaks of gender as a social construction or performance, but as Judith Butler, my guest on this episode, has argued, the second sex inaugurates the idea that gender is, in Butler's words, a kind of becoming, an embodied project of freedom. Judith, I wonder if we could begin by talking briefly about your own relationship to this book. When did you first read it, and what were your first impressions of Beauvoir's tome? (laughs) Well, I certainly read it in college, but I was aware of it before then. And when I was a graduate student in philosophy at Yale University in the early 1980s, some of my friends from the women's studies program were what was then a faculty seminar that eventually gave rise to the women's studies program. They came to me and they said, won't you give us a presentation on feminist philosophy? And I had nothing to say. I thought, I don't really work on feminist philosophy. I work in continental philosophy. I work on Hegel. I work in the tradition of phenomenology. I work in critical theory. But I, And I was a feminist, but I wasn't quite sure how I could bring my feminism to bear on philosophy. So you might say that I was, and probably still am, uh, internally compartmentalized, (laughs) and they were asking me to uh, bridge a division in myself. So I said, okay, uh, I will give you a talk on Simone de Beauvoir, which became an early piece, one of my earliest published pieces, Sex and Gender in Simone de Beauvoir, which was published by Yale French Studies, I believe, in 1986, I think maybe my second publication. So I had to think a little bit about Beauvoir, not simply as a companion to Sartre or a secondary thinker to him, but as elaborating her own philosophical point of view, which I believe she has done in several texts. And the very famous formulation, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman, became very interesting to me because, of course, if one becomes a woman, is there an end to that becoming? Is is there a point in time when you can say, I have become a woman, I am a woman. The process of becoming has come to an end. And I realized that if Simone de Beauvoir were to be consistent with her own account of situated freedom, then that situated freedom uh, never comes to an end. It's it's not what philosophers call teleological. It, it's not goal-driven. It doesn't stop so how to think about gender as a renewable and vexed form of, of freedom became important to me in those early years. And maybe uh, in the earliest essay, I, I took some Sartrean language, the language of the project, but I think I let that go in time. Now, it's actually quite exciting what you're saying, because in a sense, you're, you're inverting 
in part the meaning of that phrase because the phrase I think carries with it the idea that uh, one becomes a woman by by absorbing a lot of the ideas of what the eternal feminine is. It's a kind of indoctrination almost to become a woman. And you're actually, I think, reading it now in a much more expansive and emancipatory way as a project that a woman can assume as her own. I guess I would say that that duality can be found in the work of Simone de Beauvoir herself, that she was not uh, suggesting that gender was an act of radical freedom, freedom ex nihilo. It's not like we enter the world and decide what gender we want to be today or in the future from a place of mm, hyper-voluntarism, right, like radical freedom. In fact, she was really clear that what you're referring to as those norms and expectations that that nearly <laughs> indoctrinate us, um, that those are part of what she would call our situation. So she offered an idea of situated freedom. If we are free, then we're free within a set of constraints that have been historically inherited. We're formed in certain ways in early childhood. Certain expectations are are communicated to us, sometimes pounded into us uh, at at a psychic cost uh, for many people, not for all people, but for many. Um, and yet, we are not just stuck with this history of norms, conventions, patriarchal assumptions about what a woman or a man might be. We also struggle with them, and we have a certain kind of what I called agency, which is both historically formed and capable of remaking history. So it's important to see that as much as she understood women to be in a terrible trap, to exercise freedom, power, intelligence was to risk their status as women. Uh, she's writing in, in the late 40s. Uh, they also clearly did have a power to redefine what a woman is and can be. And it was that power of redefinition that I thought was important. It gives us a different idea of freedom, not radical freedom, not a historical freedom, but one that actually emerges from our situation and that might be understood as historically constituted in an important sense. And one of the ways in which she expressed or, or claimed this situated freedom was by following up her book, The Ethics of Ambiguity, in 1948 with a book about women's condition, the second sex. And one of the defining features of this book is the way it engages with a variety of disciplines, uh, philosophy, history, anthropology, biology, mythology, and literature. I mean, the range of reference in this book is pretty dizzying. I'm wondering, is that why Beauvoir refused to classify it as a work of philosophy. Well, you know, there are <laughs> there's a kind of larger conundrum here, which is why someone like Simone de Beauvoir or why someone like Hannah Arendt refused to call themselves philosophers. <laughs> As if the idea of the philosopher were so pervasively masculine that they couldn't possibly embody it. And of course that's it's nonsense. And she did graduate number one in her class uh, from the university. And in fact she was more highly ranked than Jean-Paul Sartre, her colleague. Uh, and there's no reason now uh, not to call her a philosopher. I would say that there's an established field of feminist philosophy that does obviously assume she's a philosopher and defend her as a philosopher and probe her thinking as one would any philosopher's texts. In fact, I think if we return to this idea of a situation, it's like, what does that mean? We are situated. We are, in some sense, born into the world in a particular time in history, and we are formed through different kinds of institutions, structures of family and kinship, schooling. We are told certain things about who we are by psychologists, by uh, medical practitioners, by politicians, and yet there is a capacity to read all of that critically, to object, to say, no, that is not who I am, or to struggle with those definitions that are so deeply imprinted. I think that the idea of situation is, is also a counter to Sartre. Sartre uses it, obviously, 
but she uses it more and differently. And even when she thinks about women as the other, which we might talk about in a moment, uh, she doesn't really cite Sartre at that moment. She's not using Sartre's idea of the other. <laughs> uh, she cites Merleau-Ponty. She cites Jaspers. She has a number. And, Le and Levi-Strauss. Yes, Levi-Strauss, for sure. So she's already taking an interdisciplinary detour from philosophy. Now, I want to say this, that like gender and women's studies today, Simone de Beauvoir's work is interdisciplinary. In other words, there's no way of dealing with the question of women's condition, or indeed, as I would say, the condition of gender. There's no way of dealing with that question through one discipline alone. It actually requires an interdisciplinary perspective, which is why gender and women's studies is necessarily interdisciplinary. And so so is African-American studies, so is ethnic studies, so are so many of these important fields that try to interrogate the social conditions of subjugation, of inequality, and of the promise of equality and freedom. So I think that she's affirming that interdisciplinarity in saying, I am not a philosopher. Maybe she's saying, I'm not only a philosopher, or she's saying... <laughs> Right. Philosophy has to change. Philosophy has to open itself up. Yes. Yes, exactly. The day that philosophy accepts that its inquiry might be best conducted in an interdisciplinary context, well, then she'll be a philosopher, as she is. Thanks for listening to this extract from Human Conditions, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episode and all our other close reading series, sign up to our close reading subscription at lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.